Uh, yeah, well, I'm Kevin Barrow. I'm a partner at uh, Osborne Clark. A uh, little bit of corporate propaganda for those of you who haven't heard of us. Um, we're an international law firm. And I think for the purposes of this sort of event, we're, we're, uh, we were asked in by JobPace because, you know, we're well known across Europe as being a leading uh, telecoms media technology law firm and we won awards for that recently. We act for Facebook across Europe, Amazon, uh, lots of social media recruiters and job sites. We sold job site into DMGT and um, we also sold Friends of United to ITN, which wasn't such a good deal for ITN. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we're well known also for straight recruitment, if you like, traditional recruitment. We're, we've been called acknowledged experts in this world. And we've, you know, those are some of our clients, uh, including also many smaller growth uh, professional and uh, technical uh, recruiters. So that's the boring bit over. Um, so I was asked to say a few things about... Uh, the legal aspects of new technology, new media, in recruitment. I can't cover the whole, the whole, all every issue, but I decided to pick out a few things, um, and I I wanted to have a look at some recent recruitment deals by major hirers engaging with major recruitment companies. How are they looking to incorporate new media? in their global staffing and recruitment programs. And there's some war stories coming out of that at the moment. And then uh, looking at some, some more sort of dry legal issues, you know, if you're a lawyer, quite an interesting thing. Technically, the way in which a lot of job sites and social and professional networking sites are monetizing recruitment is illegal. And how is the regulator dealing with that? What's going to happen next? Uh, going to look a, quick, a little bit at data ownership issues with this new era of big data. More and more data in the recruitment world, data about candidates being developed. You know, who owns it? What's the legal position? And then uh, finally, if you're the owner of a recruitment business, how do you protect the value of your business given the way that assets can walk out the door much more easily now than ever before. So how are the new deals being agreed by major investment banks, major retail banks, pharmaceutical companies, engineering companies, aerospace companies, oil and gas companies? How are they looking at social and professional networking sites? How are they looking at new technologies uh, as a route to finding talent? Um, there was some very good data uh, earlier this year about some of these things, and I think the way I would kick it off is by saying that at the moment, U.S. data says that 20% of global hirers based in the USA currently have a global hiring program in place with one prime supplier <coughs> coordinating global recruitment perm and contract or perhaps just one or the other. Another 56% plan to seriously consider one within the next two years, taking us up to about 78, 79%. There's, going to, there's, a, there's an explosion of this. We, my team in, in, in London, are absolutely overwhelmed with advising hirers and suppliers on these big programs. More and more recruitment will be controlled through these MSP and RPO arrangements. Whether it's a good thing or not, we all have our views. But it's happening. Whether it will go on forever, <laughs> well, that depends on how successful these programs are. But they are happening. And the reason, there's all sorts of reasons why the hirers think it's a good idea, and actually increased global compliance is a big one for US, US hirers. Um, but one of the things they're throwing into the pot is they're expecting the suppliers to tell them in the invitations to tender how those suppliers are going to use direct attraction mechanisms 
to disintermediate so much as possible expensive traditional recruiters. Are they expensive or not? I don't know. The alternative may be more expensive if it ends in rubbish recruitment. I know this, but that's not how hirers see it. And the way these deals are being structured is the RPO or MSP company gets a higher margin for hires where they have to go, where they have to actually take active steps in a traditional way to source a candidate or to use, they have to use a second tier, local second tier or preferred supplier locally to find a candidate. And they get lower margin where the RPO MSP merely manages the selection or onboards the candidate with some sort of direct attraction through, well, let's say at LinkedIn or something, finding the candidate or getting the candidate on the radar of the HARA in the first place. So why should the RPO MSPs drive um, greater hiring through social professional networking sites, disintermediating the, the sourcing activity of traditional recruiters? Well, because every deal we see now gives a key, an absolute main KPI to the major RPO and MSP companies to get a fixed minimum percentage of vacancies filled using direct attraction mechanisms. So the hirers aren't so much looking to drive down margin. You may feel they are the margin of the traditional recruiters. What they're actually too doing is they're actually trying to just not use you. They realise a, a good proportion of hires fire for, for specific skill sets will still have to come through traditional sources. But for certain categories, a, a large number of hirers think they don't need to pay. Whether this is right or wrong, whether they're, they're well advised or not, this is the way they seem to be thinking at the moment. So new media, new recruitment media are entrenched in the DNA of global, global hiring contracts at the moment. That's current news. That's, that's how the deals are being negotiated at this moment. So what about social, what about the legal issues, more legal issues that we're seeing associated with use of social and professional networking sites and various other technology-driven, new media-driven developments in recruitment? What are the legal issues? Well, I don't need to tell you, I'm sure, <laughs> that social and professional networking sites and there are lots of new types of job sites and job exchanges are being used in California and there, from there into the UK um, or simultaneously in California and the UK or other parts of America and the UK. They're being used by work seekers for finding work and by hirers and recruiters for finding workers. I don't need to, this to, uh, to tell you that. These sites are seeking to monetize the recruitment process big time. LinkedIn, if you haven't read it, if you never read another legal document in your life, long legal document, have a look at the IPO document issued by LinkedIn when they listed to see how they plan to monetize recruitment. 76% of their revenue in the year of listing, which was last year, they attributed to recruitment. LinkedIn is a recruitment company. It is classified by corporate finance houses in America as a recruitment company, not as a technology company. But, and this is an interesting point, within, for example, the LinkedIn prospectus, it says, under risks, so you have to tell investors about potential risks, um, how we monetize recruitment may not be lawful in some countries and we have to look at the law in each country as we go along, which is a fair comment. And what they're doing is monetizing something which is differently regulated in every country in which they try to do business. And there's a lot of regulation relating to the recruitment process because it relates to people. There's always more law about people than about things. And some people have called this the Wild West, the way in which these networking sites which are providing, I think, a very good service and are inevitable. So legal problems aren't going to stop this from happening. But there are legal 
systems are struggling to understand how they should apply to the new media and the new technologies. And since we're in the UK today, a, a specific interesting point in the UK, which does actually also apply in a few other countries, the same point applies. Recruitment regulation in the UK broadly dates from 1973, which was before the internet was thought of. Well, it was before I thought of it anyway, if any of you had already thought of it by then, well done. It's, it, the recruitment regulators thought, well, we can't allow any loopholes. We need to protect work seekers and hirers from unscrupulous recruiters. So we're going to make sure the definitions in the legislation are wide enough to stop anyone creating a loophole going round the side. And so UK recruitment regulation applies to anyone who helps hirers find candidates or vice versa. And there's a specific phrase in the regulations which says, including anyone who does this, who provides this assistance to candidates or hirers, whether by the provision of information or otherwise. And the regulator, the UK regulator, believes that applies to networking sites, job boards, and all sorts of other exchanges operating online. So the legislation applies to them. There is an exemption for newspapers, because they provide information, and the way they get around it is they're allowed to charge someone to buy a newspaper which has got information about jobs in it, without falling foul of the regulations in the Employment Agencies Act, because the regulator says, well, they're mainly not for the purpose of helping people find jobs. So if a job board or a networking site can say that it's not mainly for the purpose of helping people find jobs, then recruitment regulation does not apply to them. And that's quite important, because if it does apply to them, the first thing it does is it prohibits, as a criminal, a criminal offence, the charging of work seekers for work finding services. Membership fees, doesn't matter. Don't, it, it doesn't matter if it's, just, if it's not based on a success fee. If, it's, if any type of charge for information about jobs is illegal, a criminal offence. In addition... And the UK regulator gets quite worked up about that because the social purpose of that piece of legislation is to stop vulnerable work seekers being exploited at the lower end of the market. Uh, for those of you who've ever um, thought of becoming models, they particularly, for example, get worked up where they see young girls and boys being charged for opportunities to get jobs as models. I'm sure that's affected a lot of you, actually. <laughs> and in addition, UK recruiters are very strictly regulated uh, as to how they engage with work seekers and hirers. There has to be, there's all sorts of rules about what they must tell the work seeker or the hire about their terms and conditions and and stuff like that. Well, you know, job sites, networking sites probably can do that in their standard terms and conditions. But in addition, especially if you're supplying people to work with vulnerable, for vulnerable adults or children, for example, you're obliged as a traditional recruiter to carry out checks on the suitability of the worker. That's a strict obligation in the regulations, failure to comply with which is again a criminal offence. And as a result of this, the regulator in the UK, which isn't blind to the fact that job sites and professional networking sites do a fantastic job for the UK consumers and candidates who all actually want to find jobs using these media, actually the, the regulator is statutorily obliged to carry out investigations into uh, these new media who, who are trying to monetize recruitment uh, or, or otherwise help recruitment. They, they are being investigated. Two quite well-known organizations are currently subject to investigations. And by the way, 
it could affect some hirers who are taking in-house their recruitment function and then moving data around within their groups of companies. The same regulations could apply to them. So, so that's something about the illegality of uh, the use of new media to enable recruitment processes to, to be you know, quickened up and, and, and made more uh, well, user-friendly and cheap for hirers. Um, I should say that the regulator is going to look at this and there will be a consultation in the last quarter of this year. We'll be involved in it. Um, they're not blind to the fact that it's madness to have a blanket ban as they have, but they're very concerned about loosening the legislation because that may lead to vulnerable work seekers being exploited in some way, being conned into paying a fee for something that's not worth anything at a time where people are desperate for jobs. Um, I'm not, you'll be pleased to hear, going to spend masses of time running through this slide, but as a law firm, we're very well known across Europe for our work in, and in America, for our work in relation to digital businesses, uh, ex businesses which exploit data, uh, try to make money out of data. And we all know every year sees an absolutely massive increase in the amount of data that's being created and stored. And that includes in recruitment data about candidates. And it can be pulled in from all sorts of sources in retail, in financial services, in organisations like that who deal with consumers. They're pulling in data from, from all sorts of using web logs, uh, clickstream, all sorts of stuff to work out who might be interested in what. And of course, that sort of technology, those sorts of algorithms will sort of be adapted for the recruitment process. LinkedIn, Facebook, undoubtedly, Twitter will undoubtedly be looking at people's usages of those media to see who might be suitable for jobs over there or who might be looking for candidates of a certain type. All this massive growth in the amount of data leads to data storage issues, then lots of people, like Dan, helping analyse that data and then chop and change it to personalise it. We all know this, this is happening. It creates massive legal issues. There's privacy issues. There's all sorts of jurisdictional issues where the data is being stored in one country which has different laws to the laws of the country where the data is collected from. Uh, and we, we believe as a law firm that there's a sort of slow motion car crash happening with the explosion in the amount of data being collected by business organisations and then analysed and exploited and a very slow, massively far behind set of legal principles and laws which, which haven't really caught up with who should own it, how they're entitled to use it, when is and when isn't privacy law breached, um, and, and stuff like that. We think there'll be a lot of developments over the next five years about that. Um, and I wanted to finish off with a few words about something which is sort of unlinked to that. Can, can you just, with a show of hands, I know nearly all, if not all, of the people in this room are actually recruiters of one shape or another. Um, just can I... For who is actually an owner of a recruitment company in here, or partial owner? Good. Okay, good. Um, so this is well pitched. Um, new media is um, a good or bad thing, depending on your point of view, but, but one thing it is leading to is employees being able to generate, this is in the context of a recruitment company, the recruitment consultants themselves, being able to generate huge numbers of contacts and see the friends and connections of others. This is good. You know, you want good recruiters to be doing stuff like that. And, you know, in most businesses, they have a fairly free access to the client contacts that have been built up over the years by their <coughs> employer. And they're making these contacts all the time, and I think it's widely known that there's some confusion about who owns contacts that individuals make 
during business time with people on LinkedIn or even after work with, or, or, or any other social or professional networking site? Are you clear about who owns those contacts? Are they adding client contacts to their personal LinkedIn accounts? Almost certainly. It's hard to stop. Should you even suppress it? You know, it shows a certain entrepreneurial approach. You'd be disappointed if they didn't, perhaps. But if they leave, can they take those contacts with them? Do your restrictive covenants in your employment contracts with your workforce deal with solicitation via new media after they have left? And we are banging on and on and on about this. It comes up all the time. Everyone involved in recruitment needs to have their traditional restrictive covenants updated and they need to have a social media policy suiting whatever approach they want to take to use of social media. But you should really educate your employees about what you think you own and how they should use contact details that they make through social and professional networking sites. You should spell out the consequences of misuse and be clear with them about the extent to which you do monitor them. And there's a lot of this going on in the recruitment sector at the moment. There's a lot of legislation in America about this as well. And Germany. Um, and I think against this, you know, for those of you who say, well, what's the point, uh, what's the point of trying to protect it? Because the courts never protect us anyway. Uh, if someone does leave and I try to stop them dealing with um, ex-colleagues or ex-clients or, or candidates that they came across whilst they were with us, um, you know, the courts will just laugh. You know, it'd be too expensive. We won't go anywhere. The courts are a lot more, or have become a lot more inclined, well, it says slightly more inclined here. Our experience is a lot more, really, inclined to protect employers where employees leave and try to take the assets of the business with them. Now, we all know, I'm sure, anyone who's had to deal with this sort of unfortunate thing of someone leaving and trying to take something, that, that you're protected, you hope, by restrictive covenants in their contract of employment, which prevent them from competing in certain specific ways, but in particular prevent them from soliciting clients, customers and candidates, dealing with clients, customers and candidates, and poaching of former colleagues. Um, but what does solicitation mean in the context of social media and the use of social and professional networking sites? I left my previous firm on the 31st of December 2009 and I joined Osborne Clark the 1st of January 2010. And uh, I was having a very boring Christmas so I decided to go on to LinkedIn and I updated my profile. I don't, I'm not a very active user of any uh, networking site I just decided to just do it and within about 36 hours I had 24 emails back from people saying oh I didn't know you from clients former clients saying oh, I didn't know you were leaving we must have a cup of coffee or something like that is that solicitation was I soliciting their custom because you know, I might have had a restricted covenant from pre preventing me from dealing with former clients for 24 months after leaving. I didn't, as it happened, but, you know, because I'd negotiated a very amicable settlement with my former, in, former firm. But, you know, I could have. And this is happening all the time. And all of these things, it's unclear yet. There's been no real decided case as to whether or not someone doing these things in relation to their LinkedIn account or whatever is actually them soliciting former clients. There has been one case which was a preliminary hearing brought, uh, in the case brought by Hayes against one of their former employees called Mr. Ions. He set up a company before leaving Hayes he uploaded contacts from the Hayes database onto his LinkedIn account and he sent invitations to candidates and clients to connect with him um, through this, this, this LinkedIn account. Hayes applied for a court order asking him to disclose everyone he'd contacted. Um, 
he said, well, Hayes encouraged me to join LinkedIn. It, well, it was accepted that he'd been encouraged by Hayes to join LinkedIn and make connections. Um, he said, well, the restricted covenant in my contract of employment only prevents me from dealing with com uh, confidential information relating to Hayes, confidential to Hayes. As soon as I was allowed to put it on my LinkedIn account, it ceased to be confidential because people can see it. And the court ordered full disclosure of his LinkedIn contacts, ordered him to um, uh, provide copies of all messages sent and received through LinkedIn, and um, provi ordered him to provide invoices and emails showing the business he'd obtained as a result of those LinkedIn contacts. Now, that wasn't a fine. That was a preliminary hearing um, it, which just allowed Hayes to get some evidence. It wasn't a final decision by the court that by using LinkedIn, he'd actually breached his contract. And it was settled. It didn't go to final trial. So we don't know what a court would have actually ultimately said. Two final slides. So what can you do? What practical things can you do? Well, I recommend you take snapshots of contacts of your, you may say, oh, I can't possibly do this. These are just some ideas. You don't have to adopt them all. Have a think about them all, though. Take, take a snapshot of the contacts of all of your new employees when they first join you. Specify that new contacts added during employment, unless they can be demonstrated just to be their sister or their girlfriend, are company property. Specify they should only use their company email address when, you, when engaging in social networking and professional, ne well, professional networking anyway. Pay for premium counts. If, if you've paid for their membership, I think that helps the argument that you own what they, 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 they get. Require personal and business contacts to be kept separate. Ensure another of your employees always remains a connection of the ex-employee. Specify in your contracts of employment what you consider to be solicitation, i.e. you can't solicitate, solicit former candidates, former clients, including you can't, after you leave, you know, ask them to join a LinkedIn group or something. On departure, consider asking them to defriend relevant connections. Include in your contracts of employment with the, uh, consultants the right to ask them that, demand that. Require them to disclose approaches made to them by relevant connections. You could ask them, you could require them contractually to close a social media or professional media account. Impose time restrictions on reconnecting and ensure your, your, the client connection, contact details that they make via LinkedIn or something else are on the employer's database before, before they're deleted from the account of the, of the leaving employee. And the classic one, which has always been a good idea, seed your database with false information, which if someone tries to contact that particular client, actually goes to your finance director. So that was a whistle-stop tour of some of the key issues that we're seeing come up in relation to the use of new media. If you don't get on top of your recruitment consultants' use of social and professional networking sites, even if you never suffer a departure with someone downloading, lots, uploading loads of data, leaving and taking all the business with him, a buyer, if you're trying to sell your business, will be concerned you haven't tied down your key asset. If you don't have a policy, if you don't have restrictions, a buyer will wonder what's going to happen on the second day after they've bought. Will all of the stars leave and set up in business? Will, in fact, they have paid a load of money for nothing? Should they, in fact, pay you 97% of the proceeds of sale as earn out after 12 or 24 months? And I think there are differing views about whether or not you ever actually see the value of an earn out. I think actually sometimes they do work. But uh, you'd certainly be wise if you were a buyer to shift most of the purchase price into earn out if you can't see the seller having tied down the value of customer connection and candidate connection. So thank you very much. Right.